Hey, it's Brandi Cruz. You're watching a clip from our weekly show, Sundays with Subscribers. To get access to full episodes and more, become a subscriber to the show by visiting undividedpod.com. Dave Reichert, welcome. Hey, well, thanks for having me. <laughs> I was giving you a hard time because I feel like you went on every news channel before you came into Undivided. What's wrong with us? Well, you, you know, uh, we wanted to save the best for last. Oh, good. Good answer. <laughs> um, I, I've been very clear with people that I thought you should have ran for governor in 2020. Um, I think you would have won. Mm -hmm. But you and I sat down in 2018 and I asked you about 2020, and this is before we knew the pandemic was going to happen, the mess that would come with that. And you said at the time that you thought it would be almost impossible to win. Right. How has that and why has that calculation changed for you? Well, you know, I've, so I've been asked, uh, I think, in every cycle since 2000 to, to run for governor. So I think people are, I say, yeah, I'll think about it, never say never. And uh, I think people are getting a little bit irritated at me for it for, became like a joke. Uh, I know exactly. Yeah. So it was even a joke to me because uh, I, I, the timing uh, just wasn't right. And uh, if you talk to people that have worked for me, uh, it's one of the, one of my mantras is you know to do to accomplish something, you really have to have the timing needs to be there too. And in this case, um, when Inslee announced. Uh, of course, you have the, the opportunity of an open seat, which presents one a positive in, in the decision-making process. And then secondly, um, I've been away from this for about four and a half years now, the, I mean, politics, you know, actively engaged. And um, I had the, the opportunity to sort of sit back and watch things happen to, to the people of Washington State. And, uh, and, and just sort of became frustrated, couldn't watch the news too much uh, with, with the frustration that it caused. And then third, uh, when, when um, the governor made his announcement not to seek re-election, he made a comment that bothered me, and that was, I look forward to handing the keys over to the next Democrat governor. Oh. And, and, then, um, and then I heard that another person had entered the race who's a moderate um, Democrat uh, and Republicans were sort of flocking toward Mark Mullet. Mark Mullet, mm -hmm. and uh, the moderate Republicans were, and I th I thought this isn't it's the same right to me that um, we don't have a two party system in this state and that people who uh, happen to be happen to have some other ideas uh, don't have an opportunity to vote for someone who can present those ideas and then make a choice. You know, it's really, that's all it's about. So that sort of bothered me uh, a little bit too. And then I just felt um, compelled uh, because of all of those factors. Uh, the last thing and, and the most, probably one of the most important to me uh, is uh, the future of our kids, and I know, it's, you know, everybody says that, right? I'm doing mm -hmm. this for my kids and my grandkids. Oh, I really feel that. Um, it, we're, we're at a time and a place where five, ten years down the road, we have huge question marks as to where our children are going to be, what they're going to be learning, what our families are going to be experiencing, how much are they going to be paying in taxes and gas prices, and etc. And then the other, <laughs> I'm going through the list here, but uh, I just felt like our cops needed backup. Yeah. And, uh, you know, having been a, a police officer uh, for uh, 33 years uh, in a variety of different positions within the sheriff's office in King County, um, I wanted to be there for them. Right yeah. now they need, they need help, and, and uh, not many people are willing to stand up for them. Yeah, and we'll talk about some of those issues related to public safety, but, you know, I want to dwell on the calculations that you made just a little bit longer because uh, we also sat down right after you announced that you weren't going to um, seek your seat again in Congress, and you lamented the state of politics and the state of political discourse yeah. and how nasty it was. That hasn't gotten any better. In fact, it's no. markedly worse <laughs> in it the is, last it is worse. four years. So if that was something at the time that really turned you off to the state of things, you know, you couldn't even hold town halls anymore because right. it got so vicious. Um, you realize that that's going to be the same, if not worse, this cycle. Right. Yeah. I, I think the, the frustration for me in, in the legislative process, uh, you, you know, you have to bring um, four or five hundred other people <laughs> along with you. Right. 
uh, to get anything accomplished. And we were successful on a number of um, fronts with our legislation in Congress. But I became, as you say, more and more frustrated toward the end of my uh, 14 years in Congress because that that sort of um, um, anger uh, that that it just sort of began to build and had gotten worse. And, and I'd al also made sort of a promise to myself that I wouldn't stay in Congress um, until I was 70 years old. So I, my plan was getting out of Congress before I was 70. So that all kind of came together for me too. So, but here I am a little older than 70, uh, jumping back into this for all the reasons that I that I gave you earlier. Oh, we'll talk about your age later. I'm going to save yeah. that for the we end. We won't make that an issue, right, for some of the younger candidates. The, uh, is, who the, was that that Reagan said, right? Right. Um, when it comes to, you know, again, the state of politics <clears throat> getting worse and worse and the vitriol, the, the attacks on you have already begun. They're very predictable. Right wing, you know, too conservative, not aligned with our values, Trumper. Yeah. mega Republican <laughs> and all of that. I know. The thing that's interesting <laughs> is, without sounding like I'm trying to ingratiate myself to you, you're a nice guy. You know, you're not a bomb thrower. And, and we've had these conversations before about your frustration with those issues. But yeah. how do you be the person who I know you are as a politician and as a human being right. in that kind of political environment where the attacks on you are going to be so unhinged? Yeah. You know, um, during the, the campaigns for Congress, I, I used to get really upset uh, when you see ads that say, Dave Reichert, bad for America, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like I, I'm some sort of a monster that's, uh, that's out there waiting to just attack. Um, I've served in the Air Force. Uh, I've served in the Sheriff's Office. I've served 14 years in Congress. Um, you know, I've tried to be a servant uh, in the United States of America and try to help make things better. So I, I think I'm at a different place now where I can sort of smile at some of the, those attacks because mm -hmm. what I've discovered is uh, in these last four years plus, uh, people don't believe that crap. Yeah. And that and that is exactly what it is. That, and I thought that, you know, ads, my ads were all positive. Yes, the NRCC came in and they did some stuff that, that we couldn't communicate on that weren't positive, but that wasn't, that wasn't our ad team and it wasn't our campaign. So um, I guess I sort of smile at, at some of the um, negative remarks now. And what's interesting is that they, they come from both angles, as you said. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a mega Republican yes. from one side and then I'm a rhino from the other side. And so what that should tell people is that really, I'm someone who's moderate or independent. And, and uh, the other interesting thing is I've had time to reflect on this is, is not that I, I plan to be an independent or mm -hmm. a moderate, but that's just what happens when, when you look at problems and, and you look at the solutions to the problem rather than, you know, what, part of my frustration in Congress was that uh, people become too focused on the politically correct answer for their particular party versus what is the best answer for America. And so what I brought to Congress was trying to figure out what is the best answer, and so that puts you in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, I also like to say just one of the few thinkers, I'm not the smartest one in Congress, I wasn't obviously, but I was one of the few thinkers. And when you think about a problem and you find it and, you, and you're working toward a solution, that automatically puts you in the middle because both sides have good ideas, both sides have bad ideas, and sometimes when the good ideas come together, um, they become better ideas. Yeah. I like what you said about people don't believe that crap anymore. And I think some yeah. people do, but most importantly, persuadable people don't believe that crap. I think the yeah. people who buy into it are the ones who, they're never going to vote for you anyway. And they're yeah. like, oh, yeah, big mega right-wing Dave Riker. It's yeah. like, you don't even have to bother with them because they've already made up their minds. Yeah. Um, but about, you know, the art of sort of persuasion and consensus and um, you're going to, if you're governor, you're going to have to use that a lot because let's say that you're governor and you make history as a Republican first time in 40 years mm -hmm. and you're saddled with, for lack of a better phrase, a, a Democratic majority in the House and the Senate, um, you are going to have to work with them on a lot of things. And so 
Um, yeah. One of those issues that I think, if you're going to be a Republican governor in a state like this that has come up is abortion. Uh, yeah. I think you've addressed it out of the gate, which is good, but help people understand you're a Christian man. Yeah. Help people understand where your personal opinion on that issue might differ from who you would be as a politician on that issue. Yeah. First, first, let me touch real quickly on what you said about negotiating with a Democrat House and, and Senate as the governor. Look, I was a hostage negotiator for years in, in the sheriff's Same office, thing. right? Yep. And I, I was also the SWAT commander. So um, I've, I've sort of figured out when I went to Congress when to negotiate and, and, and when you need to kick the door in. And uh, you, sometimes, you know, a combination of both of those is, is a good way to go, Yeah, I've discovered. But uh, on the abortion issue, um, I've always been very clear I've never tried to shy away from it. It's very clearly I am pro-life, uh, with three ex exceptions. And uh, one is um, rape, two, incest, and then three, the life of the mother. But, um, you know, the, the state of Washington has had a law in place since 1978. Yeah. Right? That's when it was first passed. In 1978, I was a uh, police officer. I was a patrol cop in Federal Way. And in Federal Way, there were abortion clinics. And uh, during the, once the bill passed, the pro-life groups came out and protested the abortion clinics. They blocked the driveways and the sidewalks. And so we were called in on overtime as patrol officers to go out. And my job was to enforce the law, which I disagreed with. But my job was to keep the driveways open, the doorway open, uh, so that people could come in and have counseling and, and receive their abortions if that's what they chose to do. Um, I have the same attitude. I'm a cop at heart. Uh, the law is the law, and uh, I, I will obey the law. I will honor the law. The people of, I will honor what the people of Washington have, have chosen. And, in fact, they've codified the law even further in a couple of other votes since 1978. Mm -hmm. So um, my opinion is, too, that uh, on these issues— um, one person, the governor, or a group of politicians should not be the ones making this decision. So if ever there were some bizarre circumstance where a bill was presented um, to me, uh, I would refer that directly to the people. I'm not, so, so, <laughs> I think the important thing to know about me in this, in this race is I'm not here to, to uh, I'm not here to gain power. Mm -hmm. It's not about power for me. It's about servanthood, and it's really about trying to empower the people of Washington State. And I think for far too long, we've, we've not had that ability to feel like in this state that we're empowered to do anything about some of the topics you're probably ready to talk about, yeah. which would be homelessness and drug addiction and taxes and, and all of those things. Uh, I've sort of felt like, and again, looking at this from four and a half years uh, it's just been sort of an edict after edict after edict. Is it fair to say that if you win this race, <clears throat> this is this is it for you politically? This is your last sort of public office you're ever <laughs> going to seek? Be, is that fair to I say? I think that would be fair to yes. say, yeah. Well, let's just talk about it now before we get to the issues. You're how old? 72. 72. Yeah. Now, I've been clear. I don't think age is a factor for how competent someone is. Um, but at the same time, we've got Joe Biden, who's, I think, 80 or 81, and he's really struggling. I mean, he's really yeah. struggling mentally, and I think that's very clear. He's a decade older than you. But for people who might just be tired of the older white man, how do you get past that? Yeah. Like Joe Biden wearing people out on that issue, and then here comes Dave Reichert. Well, um, well first of all, um, Maybe we could have, uh, during the debates, we could have maybe a push-up contest or something, <laughs> yeah. something like that. You and, you know? you and Bob Ferguson? <laughs> uh, it would pay look, so I, much money to see I've that. I've been very I blessed. <laughs> I've been very blessed with uh, excellent health. You know, I've had uh, some head-on car crashes in my police car, uh, and and uh, I've been uh, I've been stabbed. I've had my throat cut. I've, I've had four knee surgeries, two back surgeries. Um, and, um, but I'm in excellent health. I walk five to seven miles a day. Can't run because the knees are a little bit, but I, I lift weights every day. I read every day. 
I, um, I'm uh, still doing uh, Spanish. I was working in Central America after, yeah. after Congress, so uh, studying Spanish, um, slowly gaining some knowledge there in, in the language. But um, I, I think people should, uh, you know, they're going to look at me and they're going to say, yeah, he looks like an old guy. And, uh, and, and so they have to decide, okay, do they, do they want the same old, same old mm -hmm. that they've had here in Washington State for 40 years? Or do they want to try something fresh and new, even though it might have 72 years? It's a lot of life experience, a lot of learning experience that I've had in my 72 years. I would say more than most people, uh, especially in my younger years growing up, um, uh, you know, a lot of difficulties uh, during my childhood and growing up, which uh, I think helped me prepare for the things that I was able to do in my career and has prepared me to be, uh, you know, challenge myself to uh, to run for governor. Yeah. I, I promised myself we wouldn't be sexist during this interview, but you're really jacked right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, Nicole might have a little crush <laughs> on you. So sorry, Nicole. <laughs> you, you are a little bit of a silver fox, so well. at least the, the the housewives will be it'll be the easy vote for you. That's funny. Um, okay, we'll stop with that. We'll get to the issues. Uh, there's a couple primary challenges that we've been having in Washington State that under Democratic control just continues to get worse. So public safety is one of them. And I know that's an issue that's very near and dear to your heart. Mm -hmm. How do we even begin to recuperate the ranks of police officers in our state? We have the lowest number of officers per capita of any state in the nation. And I don't think it's a particularly good political environment to be a police officer in. Uh, no, it's not. In fact, um, you, again, when I left Congress, I uh, immediately started working uh, in this world of rapid DNA mm -hmm. and DNA technology, not only in Central America, but across the United States. And so I've been in contact with law enforcement agencies all across the country from, from Florida to Washington State, from Maine to Southern California. And um, they're all struggling with the same issue of, of lack of support, some more than others, of course, in certain parts of the country. They still have that camaraderie with the community that's needed. I, I don't know whatever happened to community policing where the police and, and the community work together to help provide a safe community. That's sort of gone by the wayside of as, as, a, as an old school sort of thought. Um, I think that... Uh, I, I see Seattle PD, King County, and others in our uh, state uh, trying to reach across a community um, uh, uh, aisle and, uh, and educate people on what their job is. I think that's one of the most important things we can do is to educate people on really what the cops do, what can we do, and what, we, what can't we do. Um, and I, th I think that one of the most important things that we can do is to elect people who understand that uh, we have to hold people accountable and responsible. There has to be consequences. When you break the law and you step on the rights of other people, that's not acceptable. There has to be a consequence for that. It's sort of like, uh, to me, not to compare our, our adult uh, community to children. However, <laughs> as you raise children, raise children uh, you give them an inch, right? They take them off. You, if you don't teach them that stealing a piece of gum or a piece of candy in a grocery store is wrong at a young age, uh, they're going to steal something larger and larger, and pretty soon they're stealing cars. Yeah. So um, I think that uh, I, I remember uh, one thing that happened when I became the sheriff, um, and I was I was upset when the previous sheriff. Um, made uh, a decision, and the decision was based upon lack of resources, which to me is not an excuse. It's a reality. Um, it's, but... it's a reality, but it's not an excuse. Mm -hmm. there, there is always, with the way that I operate, there is always a way, always a way. Yeah. Uh, there's never, uh, there's never, the answer no or never is never acceptable to me. So he, he decided that uh, King County deputies were not going to arrest anyone with a $1,000 warrant 
or less. When I became sheriff, I changed that. The cops were upset about that rule in the first place, but it's an edict or it's a judge, judge's mm -hmm. order. A warrant is a judge's order. So we were, um, we were actually disobeying the order from uh, a judge, from the court to arrest someone. So um, I said, we're going to honor the judge's decision and we are going to arrest people with a thousand dollars or less uh, warrant but first six months amnesty pay your bill pay your mm. ticket right and you wouldn't i mean the people who were coming in were coming they were how can i pay where yeah. can i pay how can i pay i don't want to go to jail right the point is that when you when you when you have laws in society and you hold, uphold those laws people will abide by those laws and um, if you don't they won't and, and, and the other thing uh, in that lesson uh, for those people that are concerned about abortion is, again, the law was the law in that case. And that's, that's where I'm always going to be. So whatever the law is, that's, that's what we're going to do in Washington State. And if the people want to change the law, then it's up to the, uh, the, to the people that, to do that. And if their elected officials aren't passing laws that they support, uh, then they should vote for someone else to have yeah. those people in those offices. Well, to that end on public safety, I do think if we had a Governor Dave Reichert, someone who's been a cop, someone who's supportive of law enforcement, I think that goes a long way to morale, right? And towards sort of messaging this idea of, no, we are going to care about law and order. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, though, we have a ton of public safety challenges, and we have people who continue to elect individuals who uh, want to limit the rights of or uh, want to lim limit the ability of officers to pursue dangerous criminals. They want to at every opportunity seek to reduce sentencing enhancements. Yeah. They want to, you know, not put juveniles who commit serious crimes in jail. And so if you're the governor and you're faced with a legislature that keeps pushing through those sorts of pro-criminal policies, I mean, what can you really do besides just yeah veto veto things well yeah exactly those laws won't be passed i won't sign them yeah well what can you do to undo yeah. the laws that have been pushed through that have yeah. i mean you really can't as governor well right? I, I think there are uh, you know if you talk about uh cooperation and working with people um and i know it's not going to be easy yeah. with with the personalities that you described or the or the positions where people are coming from um on those policies uh, however, there are things that they would like to accomplish too. And, uh, and a lot of those would be in the social services realm where um, I have been actually my whole life has been a part of my effort in, in enhancing social services because I think they go hand in hand with law enforcement. If you swing all the way over here to say social services, and I'm just using that terminology to encompass uh, every aspect of of, uh, of help that we can provide through government services and, mm -hmm. and non-government uh, services. If you think the answer lies over here, every answer, and you eliminate th this whole idea of law and order, th this isn't going to succeed. Mm -hmm. And then if you eliminate social services and then you think that all the answers are going to be in the law enforcement realm, you're wrong, and that's not going to succeed. So to me, it would be the governor going to the, the, the people in the legislature and also the people of the state saying, what, what do you think? What do you want to do? What do you want to accomplish? Because here's what I want to do. Well, let's give you a problem-solving <laughs> exercise then. Tara Simmons, she's a state representative. She was the first formerly incarcerated individual to be elected to the state house. Nice woman, cares a lot, but proposes some policies that I think are absolutely wild. Two sessions ago, she introduced a policy that would have reduced the punishment for drive-by shooters who kill someone. Mm -hmm. um, and she, I think, one of her primary concerns is especially younger men who are getting caught up in the criminal justice system. So if she's got some wild policy she wants to put forth to reduce prison time for people who commit violent crimes, how can you go to a Tara Simmons and say, hey, let's let's work together on the underlying cause? What could be something you could work yeah. with her with? Yeah, I, I know I mean, I know a perfect uh, place to, to begin, and that would be with a, pro, a program called Dads in, in downtown Seattle. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Marvin uh, and his wife started Dads. Have you ever heard of Dads? I haven't. So uh, they are, they're a group, uh, and the name suggests this, obviously, that w works with young men, in uh, the community on Rainier Avenue and surrounding communities 
to help them understand to take responsibility for fathering a, a child and for working and becoming uh, good law-abiding citizens. And um, so I, it was an interesting, um, I met them in a very interesting way. Uh, they, working in Seattle, I was a member of Congress, of course, downtown Seattle was not in my district, mm -hmm. but they called and wanted to meet. So they came into the office um, and uh, sat down and I, his wife's name is just totally escaping me right now and I apologize to her. But she started the conversation with, you probably don't remember me, but um, I was working in the street in the mid, mid 80s as a prostitute. And um, I had an opportunity to talk to you. And um, <clears throat> so emotional meeting, obviously. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we started to share a little bit. And, um, and, and, and I noticed that Marvin was sort of looking down and uh, he looked up and he said, so it's my turn to talk now. He said, I, I'm very ashamed of this, but I was one of those men who, who put uh, people like my wife on the street. He was a pimp. He was a pimp. And he said he was a pimp. Mm. And uh, so I don't think I, I met him personally during that uh, yeah. time frame. But um, he said, so what, what we've done is uh, we have found God and... Uh, we pray together and we have started this organization that works with young men uh, in, in the community, as I said. So, so in addressing problems that we have today, we just, th these problems just didn't happen. They, they progressed from a point in time and, and here we are today. So we have to start at the beginning and, and those lessons that uh, Marvin and his wife and his team are teaching, those are important lessons that children need to learn at a young age in order to be successful adults. So they're not in the criminal justice system. So they aren't these people that now we have to figure out. They got caught up in crime. They got caught up in the criminal justice system. Now, now we need to let them out early to hopefully hope and pray they become you know, law-abiding citizens. Well, that's a big hope and a big prayer. Prayer. So uh, to me, we've got to start this early, and we can't give up on those folks that did get caught up. There are programs out there to help them, but um, you've got to get them before they've taken someone's life um, and committed, you know, other, other serious crimes. Uh, they can, those people can... Uh, change, but um, much, much harder to accomplish. Yeah, and I think an overarching question that is relevant to a lot of the issues we're facing around substance abuse mm -hmm. on the streets and the crime that accompanies a, a substance abuse issue, uh, homelessness to some extent, um, when you have people who are living on the streets and committing crimes to sort of survive um, and up to violent crime, mm -hmm. there's this debate about what is the balance between compassion and accountability. Where do yeah. you see, as a former law enforcement officer and then someone who wants to be in charge of the state and help figure out policy, what is the line between being compassionate and understanding and holding people accountable who victimize others? Yeah, I, I, well, that's, that's a line that moves. It's, mm -hmm. that's, not a, that's not a line that you can just draw you know, like uh, the, the red line that some presidents have drawn in the sand. <laughs> yeah. uh, it, it, that's not a line you can draw. It, it, it's a line that's gonna, gonna have to move and just and, and shift. Mm. And um, that's because, uh, you, you know, every individual is different, every city is different, and uh, the problems are, di are different in different cities. The problems of the homeless um, and, and and, and homelessness really is sort of a misnomer, in my opinion. It's it's really about mental illness, uh, drug addiction, and alcoholism. Uh, and if you're drug addicted or alcohol uh, addicted, uh, more often than not, mental illness is connected to the problem. And with those combined, uh, you can see why some people are on the street. And if, if, if those three uh, characteristics are involved in one personality, uh, uh, to me, uh, there has to be some compassion there because that person is not going to make be able to make a rational decision as to whether or not um, you know don't bother me I want to I want to live on the street right. I'm fine right here 
uh, well, we have to have the courage to say, no, you're not fine right here. We're, we're going to help you. And, and uh, that's where I, I think the communities need to be engaged more because I think we all need to take responsibility for cleaning this mess up. Uh, and again, this is not a problem that just, just happened overnight. This has been building for years. I, I can go back to the 70s and, and, and explain some of the laws that have been eliminated that help people stay on the street and, and made it easier for them to avoid uh, uh, receiving mental health care, alcohol drug addiction care. Um, those, those things are, are essential for us uh, to help uh, people get off the street. And uh, you, can't, you can't allow people to, um, again, you're stepping on the rights of other people when you're living in the uh, doorway of a business or an apartment complex down south, downtown uh, or any other place, or, or you're defecating in the street and, and among other things, uh, you're creating a, a, you know, a danger and a hazard to uh, other people. What, what we want to do is keep people safe and we want to help people get out of the, their situation. So sadly, I've, I've, uh, you know, I've seen this uh, upfront and, and, and personal uh, especially during the Green River uh, days, um, yeah, it's, it's sad. It's, it's sad. sad. Yeah. yeah. To that end, though, you know, the governor, and I'm happy to hear someone who wants to be governor at least acknowledge that it's not a housing issue. I mean, when I hear people paint homelessness as a housing crisis, I'm like, good God, you'll never fix it. No. But, you know, they're pouring a bunch of money into, you know, more affordable housing. Do you believe that someone who is benefiting from government-funded um, housing, be it a tiny house or an apartment, uh, if they have a mental health issue or a substance abuse issue, do you believe that treatment should be a requirement yes. of them getting the housing? Yeah, yes. absolutely. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense to just give people a gift and say continue on with the same behavior. I think most people in the state would would um, would agree with that except the lawmakers in olympia they don't agree yeah agree I, with that. I i mean what so. we have to get I was, uh, I was talking to some someone the other day um uh, as i said i walk five to seven miles i get stopped probably three or four times uh by people just pulling over and giving me a piece of their mind you know? yeah um but uh i i just i just think that um we we can't give continue to give people things there has there has to be uh, accountability and responsibility attached uh, to uh, this offer of of help right why do you think that became a controversial concept yeah so so um, because common sense isn't common anymore yeah <laughs> right and 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 why uh, common sense has disappeared uh, I, I wish I had the answer to, yeah. to that, but I, you know, I go back to just, I, I could, like I said, go back to the seventies and just walk us through as to how we got here it takes too long. But if we just look at WTO mm -hmm. and what was happening during WTO, I, I was, uh, as the sheriff, again, I was, I was focused on what's the law and, and what should my officers do when I deployed them from the basement of the King County Courthouse on Monday night, when at first we were told they weren't going to need us, but I knew they would, mm -hmm. um, and we marched out on the, on the street. Um, the, the attitude of the mayor, which impacted the attitude of their, their chief and their police department, was... Uh, uh, they were on a radio, the mayor was on a radio show, and he said, come down to Seattle, enjoy uh, watching uh, people express their First Amendment oh. rights. So I was next on the radio show, and I said, please don't come down <laughs> to Seattle right. because uh, oh, we're going to have, it's going to, we're going to have a riot. There are 500,000 people expected downtown, mm -hmm. and sure enough, we had, you know, dumpsters and fires and not nearly the mess uh, during CHOP. But it was significant, to say the least. And um, the, the, the mayor allowed them to take over a building downtown, if you recall. I forget what the name Sounds of the building familiar, is. Yeah. And there was also pizza that was apparently bought for the people who, the anarchists who took the building. 
and they gave them sleeping bags to make them comfortable in these buildings. Uh, sound familiar? Uh, it it does, chopped. Yeah. <laughs> they, so it, it progressed from one building to uh, how many blocks within six. the city? Yeah. You know, six blocks they took over. So um, if you, you you can't have that sort of an attitude uh, and, and let and, and expect the city to, to survive and be healthy, but that attitude started in 1999 and before but in 1999 that's where i go back and i say the same attitude existed then as it exists now only worse yeah um there's a closing narrative i want to get to with you but <clears throat> just i want to challenge you with one thing on this issue about compassion and accountability that this is something i personally struggle with and i don't have an answer to when i think about it myself so i'm gonna see if why is Dave Reichert has a solution? Yeah, right. <laughs> so, you know, we've gone through a lot in the last couple of years with government overreach and the pandemic, and I value liberty. Um, I do. But when I see some of these people who are severely mentally ill or severely drug addicted, who, as you pointed out earlier, they can't make rational decisions for themselves. Mm -hmm. Would you support strengthening any sort of laws around involuntary commitment or involuntary treatment for those individuals? Uh, yeah, you know, I, I remember what the law was when when I was uh, working in the sheriff's office, and that was if you're proven to be a harm to yourself or others. I don't even think that's the test anymore. So uh, what, what I would do first is say, okay, we let's, let's take a look at the laws that we currently have on the book, all the laws that would cover any sort of um, effort to, to give assistance to, to uh, the cities, to the people who are uh, in the drug addicted, alcohol addicted, mentally ill um, uh, community. And, and let's use those laws first. If we need to strengthen the laws, mm -hmm. then absolutely, let's take a look at strengthening those laws. But right now, we're not even applying the, are, are you a harm to yourself or are you, and or are you a harm to someone else? We're not even applying that standard uh, to our, our, our offer of help. So obviously if somebody is sitting on the street, uh, full of fentanyl, heroin, cocaine, or whatever drug they're addicted to, or, or alcohol, and they can't even, uh, you know, form a word mm -hmm. and they're half naked laying on the sidewalk, obviously they're not, um, they're a harm to themselves right. at the very least. Right. So we should be compassionate enough to walk by our neighbor and see them in the state and pick him or her up and give them help. Yeah. I mean, that's just common sense to me. Yeah. But again, common sense. It's, 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 it's also, it's also the Christian thing to do. Uh, that happens to be my faith. It's just helping people, serving people, uh, being a servant of the people. I call it, I call it having the heart of a servant where you put someone else's needs before your own. Yeah. yeah. Let's close with a couple thoughts. Um, I, I, and again, I'm transparent. I've said to you, I think that if you can't win as a Republican, it probably can't be done. Uh, and I think the party should just move on from that idea and focus on other things for a while. But you, to what extent do you realize that this is going to be a very tall task still, even with someone of your name recognition and experience? Uh, well, <laughs> 40 years is a long time, right? So that's the yeah. first clue. It's not going to be, it's not going to be easy. We've had other candidates like Dino Rossi and Rob McKenna and others who have, who have tried, uh, Rob, uh, the most, um, uh, recent, uh, serious candidate that I can uh, think of, um, came close, but wasn't successful. Um, I, I think that, uh, I get encouragement from what I hear um, from friends and neighbors and people, that, again, that are just stopping me at the grocery store along the street, I'm a Democrat and I'm going to vote for you. Um, a lot of that uh, lately. And, and uh, recently, uh, I think a couple of days ago, I don't know if you read The Hill or if you look at any of the uh, newspapers back east, but The Hill announced that uh, this race had actually changed from a solid Democrat uh, governor race to uh, battleground. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember the last time that this governor's race in Washington State was placed in that battleground arena. Yeah. And um, I, I think that's encouragement. I'm, I'm, again, I mean, it's, you know, it's the people make their choice. They look at their, their candidates and they go, okay, I think I can trust this guy. 
Yeah. And, uh, and I hope people see that in me that, uh, you know, I'm, I, I just want to make a difference. Not every Republican was thrilled with your entry into the race. Um, I'm sure, you know, as, as gracious as Raul Garcia has been in running for Senate instead, I'm obviously that wasn't his first choice, but he saw the kind of writing on the wall. Uh, Sammy Bird is still running for governor, though, and you mm. kind of alluded earlier to some people call you a rhino, and I hear that a lot from Sammy Bird supporters, that they want, you know, a diehard conservative, they don't want a rhino. Is it your expectation that Sammy Bird will drop out of the race at some point. Mm -hmm. Have you expressed? Have you asked Sammy Bird to drop out of the race? Well, first, you know, Raul, uh, very gracious um, gesture on his part, as you, as you said. I just want to recognize that. And um, as far as as Mr. Bird is concerned, um, you know, if he wants to stay in the race, he he can, he can stay in the race. Uh, if Mr. Mullet wants to stay in the race, he can certainly stay in the race. It's uh, the people will make their choice at at the uh, at the polls on uh, primary voting day. Have you asked Sammy Bird to um, set aside? I, 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 we've we have uh, requested um, a conversation, but he's having trouble finding room on his schedule. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to be very, polite. I'm very trying to be polite. <laughs> Well, you know, we're all going to be at the Summer Freedom Fest uh, this coming Saturday, and yeah. so maybe you two can have a, a little meeting I'm backstage. Happy to talk, I'm, I'm happy to talk to anybody. I don't, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. But to know, that end, matter. you know, there are going to be some people who, if that's the decision he makes, and I know the Republican Party is trying to move towards sort of a pre-primary nominating process, mm -hmm. and I had Sammy Bird in that seat, and he promised me. He said, if it's this is before we anyone knew you were going to get in, and he said, yeah, if I'm not the nominee... Um, I will drop out. And he was unequivocal about it. So mm -hmm. I don't know if he's changed that opinion, but how do you, the, the Republican Party has been fra increasingly fractured. Uh, you know this, and that was true when you left Congress. Mm -hmm. So um, how do you, if there are some people further to the right who are upset um, that maybe their candidate now doesn't have a chance, how do you, because you can't afford to have any dissent in the Republican Party in this yeah. state. You have to be together. So how do you accomplish that? Yeah. Well, first of all, you know, when I th when I decided to run for governor, the effort was going to be and is uh, trying to bring the state together, right, to, to uh, attempt to solve some of the problems that are facing mm -hmm. people here in, in Washington state. And when um, Raul and I uh, had our conversations, more, more than one, and we came to an agreement, and he graciously um, um, left the governor's race and went to to the senatorial race. Um, that to me was was not only a signal to the Republicans uh, in the state of Washington that we're we're we're, we're trying to mm -hmm. bring the party together, but we're also trying to bring people in the state together too, so that people could see look look what Dave and Raul have done. Uh, first time this has ever happened. Maybe they maybe they got something going here. Yeah. You know, and and um, I'm I'm you know Mr. Bird can do you know what Mr. Bird is going to do, but I'm I'm hoping at some point that he also wants to be a part of that 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 movement where we we look at other opportunities for candidates. Um, by the way, um, a surge of people calling, wanting to know you know. Would you support me if I ran for city council here or school board here? We're, we're getting a lot of conservatives, a lot of Republicans looking at, okay, this might be a chance for us to uh, to look at a local race. Yeah. Let's end with this, because we've hardly mentioned who would likely be your general election opponent, if it comes down to that, Bob Ferguson. There has been a feeling <clears throat> that he is sort of the heir apparent to the job. Um, describe for people what you think Washington could look like under your leadership versus a Governor Bob Ferguson? Well, I, I think the first thing, um, I, I don't believe that um, the last 40 years has been the most open and honest government, even though that's you know what's supposed to be portrayed to us, right? So an example of that, I think that people could expect would sort of that uh, sort of an edict, sort of a government continuing 
Um, I think um, here, here we're, we're in a place where we've got over a $2 billion surplus in our budget, but there's still a desire to tax, and one of those taxes is the gas tax. The governor could do um, a couple of things uh, to lower the gas prices. Um, the, the carbon tax um, market could be adjusted. Um, the standards uh, to which they've applied uh, to people and factories, companies uh, in their emissions could be lowered. To lower the gas, they told us it was only going to be two cents or pennies. three pennies a gallon, or now at almost 50 cents more a gallon. And then we're told that, um, well, you know, the reason it's almost 50 cents a gallon is that the refineries aren't able to uh, keep up with the demand and we don't have enough refineries so they can't refine the oil to make enough gas so that's raised the prices and also the other uh, favorite line is the gas companies are gouging you that's why we're paying 50 no it's because the carbon tax has been adjusted in a way that's created 50 cents tax on the gallon that's why we're paying so much that's one example um the the other is uh you know, the voters in this state have over and over said, uh, we don't want an income tax in this state. And what's the first thing that this government has done? Uh, they've found a way around that, and they've identified capital gains tax as an additional tax, even though the IRS has defined capital gains tax as an income tax. They forced it through a Democrat court and decided that we're going to pay another tax, even though we have $2 billion in, in surplus. So if people want to see that same kind of government that's twisting and turning the words and twisting and turning the desires of the voters of Washington State, not just Republican voters, but all voters, I think are looking at higher prices in just about everything, uh, and not being told the truth as to why they are so high. Yeah. And, and, and they're not also not being told the truth as to where's the $2 billion going. Yeah. I, I don't know. Uh, when I get in, I'm going to find out, though. <laughs> but but, uh, but uh, I hope that when I'm the governor, um, people see the difference will be I, I'm going to be open. I'm going to be honest. And, and I mean that. Uh, I mean it. Truly mean it. And we're going to seek uh, input from the people here in Washington State. We want to empower the people of Washington State to make these decisions um, and, and also know where their tax dollars are, are going. So that, that'll be the difference. All right, Dave Reckert, we're going to have a lot of time, hopefully, to have you back in from now until November of 2024. But uh, good luck to you. Thanks. And uh, I, for one, am looking forward to, I think, what will be one of the most interesting gubernatorial races I've covered in my career. So thanks for the... Uh good yeah. story content for the podcast for the next <laughs> right. year and a half. I right. appreciate I it. Think, yeah, that's one thing. I think the news media, I, I noticed they were pretty excited when I jumped in, and I know it wasn't because of me. I, I, I'm pretty sure it was because, hey, we have now a, you know, a story. We, we get content. So yeah, that's exactly. I'm sure that factored into your decision so, is, can you give us good podcast content? Yeah. And you well, did. So, happy yeah. to help all the media uh, people here in the state of Washington. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Right.